Today I have something extremely interesting and fascinating to share with you and I've entitled this The Cosmic Waters of Eden and I have to warn you right from the start before you decide to go on this journey with me I'm going to share some interesting things with you a lot of things are going to challenge you to the core and that's I have to put the warning out if you are if you find yourself in a conservative Christian circle uh, if you, um, that believer that likes to stick with the Sunday school narrative, it's fine, no condemnation, no judgment, but uh, uh, some of the stuff is going to upset you, it's going to mess you up, but it's going to mess you up in a positive way, I can guarantee you that. And before we begin, I have to uh, re-emphasize this, that I consider myself to be a Christocentric mystic, all right? Now, when I say Christocentric mystic, I mean every message I put out, every piece of content I put out there, the central focal point has to be Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And, you know, you could argue this, uh, the argument is, was Paul a mystic? I firmly believe so. And I believe the scripture gives us uh, a clear indication that he was. He says he received his revelation directly from Christ through divine revelation, independent of the other, the other apostles that walked with Jesus physically. So Paul was a a Christocentric mystic. So I consider myself as a Christocentric mystic. And the reason why it's important for, for me to bring that up is because a lot of the stuff that's put out there on social media, even preach beyond pulpits, uh, they, like for example, let's take the message of Eden. There are different variations, interpretations, theological ideas. Uh, some would call it revelation, although a lot of it is actually delving into chariot mysticism, Kabbalah, or what they call Makava chariot mysticism, which is an earlier addition to the Kabbalah mysticism. And uh, I'm not saying any of those th things are not truthful. I believe that. Um, you know, we can bring different interpretations within our church circles. God can give divine revelation to one person or another person. And we can even use certain mystical insights, let's say from, from chariot mysticism, and we can converge them and create a nexus and create a, a, a beautiful picture to present, not only to our Christian circles, but to the world and to unravel the the mysteries of uh, our very or the fabrics of our uh, creation of our existence of the the universe the cosmos so it's very important that we understand these things that the, the message has to lead to a focal point which is Christ Jesus and the redemptive work of Christ Jesus so uh, the cosmic waters of Eden like I say uh, it, this can, it's got the potential to mess you up if you do not follow with me closely and listen with an open heart. So if you are, um, if you have enough courage to do that, let's begin. So we're going to begin asking a question and you'll understand why I'm asking this question as we go along. Do we live in a hyperspatial universe or are there parallel worlds and are we just one that runs parallel to others that are independent of ours? And it goes back to the analogy or the, the demonstration, the very basic demonstration I did in the first video. And if you haven't seen that, I will have a link in the description for you to go and watch that. But we said that um, we live in a three-dimensional hyperspace and there is a fourth dimension the unseen one which we cannot access physically. And the Bible alludes to this unseen realm. It's mentioned throughout the Bible about this unseen realm that um, is there. We know it's there. It's within our earth realm, but we cannot physically access it. Now, um, I appreciate and I'm highly thankful for the work of the late Dr. Michael Heiser, who really brought a whole new understanding and paradigm to the Christian world of this unseen realm and of the divine council, the Elohim. And um, this unseen realm, uh, the biblical definition or the church definition that was pushed out into the Christian world is about we have this spiritual world, this ethereal world, this realm that is non-physical, immaterial, that runs independent, parallel but independent to ours. 
and it's a spiritual world with ghosts or, or, or angelic beings that are ghost-like and there is no concept of time there is no concept of anything there other than just floating around and it's this this uh, abstract uh, ethereal type of realm or world and um, I I challenge that concept and obviously I used to be a, a, a believer of that but I reached a point where I uh, realize there's deeper understanding and meaning to the things or that's actually laid out in the Bible but we have been indoctrinated by concepts that were handed down to us so now I used to be a believer of the multiverse concept but because I'm truthful and I want to remain truthful to myself and to my followers and to anybody that listens to anything I have to say that I had to Deviate. I had to move away from that concept because I believe it. Not o- only is it unbiblical, it is actually, it's not even scientifically accurate or realistic. So I hold to the concept or the belief that we exist in a hyperspatial universe, and I believe that heaven, the angels, the angelic realm, uh, the fallen angels, demons, spirits human beings creation the earth i believe we are all existing or we all exist in this physical universe which i believe the bible calls all creation all creation romans 8 19 is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of god so yes and i know this is very unorthodox it moves completely away from the common understanding of heaven I believe heaven is a physical place. I've done, I did a video of this over a year ago and I was completely ridiculed by it. And people were that is like absolutely ridiculous. But when you actually uh, dig deeper into the concept, you'll find out that it's actually not only is it logical, but it's biblical. So I believe heaven has locality and physicality. Now I can't tell you where heaven is located. But I do believe heaven is located within our known universe. I believe the angelic function within our known universe, but they enjoy extra dimensional realities or privileges, should I say, to us. So uh, I know that's a very foreign concept and an anomaly from the mainstream Christian view, but stay with me on this ride, fasten your seatbelt. We are going to go into a very interesting adventure. So hyperspatial universe versus parallel worlds. Now remember from this demonstration. So this is a three-dimensional hypercube. Now, if you look at this as a square in a 2D world, what we would call flat land, all right? Flat land. Now, this looks like a square, but in actual fact, it is a cube. So if I tilt it to a degree, let's say 33 degrees, you now get a deeper insight into a greater reality. You now perceive reality from a higher dimension. We have a three-dimensional hypercube. And we live in a 3D world. Our Earth realm is actually a four-dimensional world. But like I say, the fourth one, we cannot physically access. So um, this is a 2D world. Now, it is a cube. But picture now, imagine this cube is living in a 2D world. It lives in flat land, but it is a cube. It looks at itself in the mirror and it sees a square. And it thinks it's a square living in a 2D flatland world, but in actual fact it is a cube and if it allows itself to think deeper or out of its current paradigm, it will actually realize or get a spiritual awakening that it actually is a cube living in a 2D world. So it's a cube thinking it's a square living in a limited paradigm. So now we can take it a step higher with the the Tesseract, which is a four-dimensional hypercube. So the question we could ask is, now let's personalize this in a human context. Could we be, or are we Tesseracts? Are we four-dimensional objects or beings living in a three-dimensional world, thinking we are cubes, thinking we are three-dimensional hypercubes, where in actual fact we are four-dimensional hypercubes, tesseracts. So that is something to ponder on. We know that we have three dimensions within us. We have spirit, soul, body. So um, 
this does this mean that the spirit and the soul are ethereal ghost-like immaterial things entities or is it just that we are higher dimensional beings we are cubes but we're living in a 2d world thinking we're squares we were actually something greater very interesting to ponder on so that is just to start to challenge your thinking as we move on all right are we tesseracts living in a three-dimensional world thinking we are cubes when in actual fact we are something higher so the cube enjoys a greater dimensional reality than the square it has a greater advantage because it is not limited as a 2d object is just as the higher dimensional beings the angelic beings have a have an advantage over us humans because they enjoy higher dimensions they have access to higher dimensional realities so that leads me to the next slide and it's important for us to understand the concept of what is known as prophetic iconography now Prophetic iconography is a way of using symbols and allegories to explain something that is more profound, has a deeper meaning. Now, the Bible does a brilliant job at conveying or relaying a message to us, to humanity, that is living in a limited paradigm. The Bible does a magnificent job to communicate a higher dimensional message and it does this using iconography symbolism and allegories for example the tree of knowledge the the apple that eve ate the tree of life the serpent even are these literal things or are these are these uh, uh, um, symbols that carry deeper more profound meaning and I would have to say yes, absolutely. Now, this does not mean, listen carefully, this does not mean we move away from the literal events that took place. I believe the Genesis account was literal. The creation event was literal. The, 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 the account with Eve eating the apple, being deceived by the serpent and everything, that was literal. It was literal events that took place. But the whole picture is filled with prophetic iconography it's, iconography, it's filled with uh, uh, pictures and allegories and symbolism. Like, for example, in Revelation, Jesus is not walking around with a sword coming out of his mouth. It's prophetic iconography. All right. So important that we understand that we that we establish that as we move along. So prophetic iconography, the book of Genesis, features rich iconography portraying significant events and themes that have been interpreted and represented in various artistic and literary forms throughout history. This includes symbolic representations of creation, the fall of man, and the covenant with humanity with artists and scholars examined through iconographic analysis. Great, so let's move on. Let's go to the question. And I'm presenting things in question form because we are building up, it's where we are, we are reaching a crescendo and a, a common meeting place of understanding or awakening. So stick with me. Now, what is heaven? The question, oh sorry, where is heaven? Like I said, I cannot tell you where it is, but I do believe it has locality and it has physicality. I, I believe heaven functions or is subject to the order of time or to a time factor. Like I said, I've done a video in the past on this and I don't believe heaven is in eternity. We know that God stands outside of time, out of, outside of dimensional realities. God is in the place of eternity, but I don't believe heaven is in eternity. I believe heaven, heaven functions within a different time capsule. We, we know that there are time dimensions. So I believe heaven, I don't believe heaven functions according to our time, but it does, I, it is subject to a time factor. I firmly believe that I, I can have, I have scriptures that can back that up. Revelation chapter 8 verse 1 says that there was silence in heaven for the space of an hour and a half. Then Revelation 14 talks about a new song that was sung. So if there's a new song that was sung, that means there had to be a song before, an old song. Now, I'm not saying heaven functions according to our linear chronological time, but there is a concept, there is a function of time in heaven because they're singing a new song. They are doing something new that they did not do before. They did something old. So... I know that might be new to a lot of you, it might be foreign, it might even sound ridiculous, but I challenge you to think beyond your paradigm. 
but I, I, I really challenge you to, to, to stick along with me and I'm sure that you are guaranteed to be blessed and it's interesting. Like I say, this is not the foundations of our Christian faith. It's not heresy. I'm not preaching against the atonement or against the Godhead or the nature of Christ or the physical resurrection. I'm not preaching against the physical return. I'm just diving into interesting mystical ideas. A lot of things that are played with, plagued with ambiguity in the scriptures and there are different interpretations. For example, let's take eschatology. Some believe pre-trib rapture, some believe post-trib, some believe mid, some don't believe, some believe armillennial some believe preterism, full preterism. There are so many different branches within eschatology. Does that mean they're all heretics? No, they just have various different ter interpretations. And that is what I'm sharing and presenting to you. So the question is, where is heaven? Like I say, I believe heaven and earth were once, they were one unit. They were connected intimately and intricately connected. And I believe heaven ruled earth by proxy. I'm not saying they were uh, in close proximity as in that together, but there was definitely a kiss between the two where they functioned as a unit. And at the fall, the earth fell from a higher state of reality into a lower state. It fell from that state into a lower state. And that is what we've been left with from the fall. So, and I believe that they, would re they will re-engage when Christ returns. Now this takes us to a further question. And the question is, what is Eden? Where is Eden? Some say Eden is located in the earth. Now, I don't believe Eden is on earth. Uh, I don't believe it's on Mars. Okay, some believe it's on Mars. I don't believe that. But I don't believe Eden is actually, I don't believe it was ever physically located on earth. Like I say, that also might challenge your thinking, your understanding, your belief. But, uh, and we're going to get there. So the question is, where is Eden? What is Eden? There is a misconception that Eden was the garden of Adam and Eve, or this was the garden where Adam and Eve were placed in on the earth. Now, I don't believe that is necessarily true. When the Bible talks about Eden, you remember there's uh, an account in Ezekiel where God is talking uh, about Lucifer to Lucifer and he's saying you are in the garden of God so the garden of God is Eden Eden is a garden in the house of God now a lot of people would use even theolo theologians would use um, certain terms interchangeably like Eden paradise the house of God uh, the mountain of God the mountain of Yahweh or heaven they will use these uh, terms interchangeably to describe the, the heaven or the place or the house of God. But I believe Eden specifically, Eden is a garden that is located in the house of God. All right, stay with me. Eden is a garden that is situated in the house of God. Then we read in Genesis uh, where God says he took man and he placed him in a garden in the east of Eden. So there's two gardens. There's two gardens. There's God's garden, and then there's Adam and Eve's garden. So we have Eden, God's garden in God's house, and then we have Adam and Eve's garden, which was a central hub, or it was an archway to the garden of God. So this is important now what I'm saying, because it's gonna really lay the foundation of the template for what I'm gonna explain. So. When we talk about the garden and Adam, or the, the, the garden that Adam was in, now not Eden, that's God's garden, but the garden east of Eden. When we talk about God, Adam and the garden, they are also used interchangeably. So Adam is the garden, the garden is Adam. Was he in a garden? Yes, but they work hand in hand, they're together, all right? They work simultaneously. So the garden of Adam was a hub or an archway. Some talk about a gate, some say a stargate. Uh, Timothy Alberino's work, he, he, he uh, does a very good job at explaining this uh, in a futuristic way, that, and on a, in a contemporary way, that uh, the garden and Adam was a stargate to the garden of God, or a stargate to the house of God, a stargate to heaven, an access point. So we have to dig deeper into this and get 
deeper meaning and understanding and what this means to us which we're going to try and do in this video or i'm going to try and do in this video so adam was a son in the father's house and he was placed and given this garden to rule from to govern the earth remember adam was sent into the earth realm to be vice regent of planet earth to be a representative of the kingdom of heaven and establish that kingdom in the earth realm and there were four rivers that came out of adam's garden and the four rivers were to give life and sustenance to the earth we're going to get to the four rivers now and um, the title might give it away for you already the cosmic waters of eden okay the cosmic waters of eden so adam was a gateway a stargate to heaven eden a stargate to god's house the house of god where he god has his own garden in his house which is eden and the next slide so remember eden is the father's house also known as the mountain of yahweh also interesting very important for where we're going the mountain of yahweh also described as god's house now before we get to the four rivers or the cosmic waters of Eden uh, that converge at this central point or this hub which is called Eden or the mountain, the summit where the gods meet, important for where we're going. But before we get there, let's go back to heaven and earth. So remember, earth fell from a higher state to a lower state at the fall, meaning Adam also fell to a lower state of reality. And he was denied access to the Garden of Eden. Oh, sorry, to the tree of well, yeah, to, to the tree of life. And now here's an interesting thing to, to, to think. Let me throw this in. Think about. It. Let me throw this one in. Was the tree of life only denied access to mankind or to Adam and Eve and the larger uh, part mankind? And the question would be no. The divine counsel, the Elohim. And I go back to the work of uh, Dr. Heiser because the the Elohim, the divine council, is not specifically talking about the triune Godhead or Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the supreme council. But the Elohim that came to a decision and decided, you know what, we're going to uh, guard the way to the tree of life um, so that man will not partake of it and live forever. This was the divine council. The sons of God that are in the Father's house, sons of God that are in that look like us, can do things like us. They can eat, they can drink, they can copulate. But this is a a, a part of our family that never came to earth. And I, now this is really going to mess you up because we 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 getting we're hitting the hot areas there now. So, all right, and. Uh, I love the work of uh, Timothy Alberino. He terms it the elder race. We look like them. So we have a family of beings that we look like, but they never came to earth. They're called the sons of God. The sons of God rejoice at the creation of heaven and earth. Uh, it's also mentioned in the book of Job, where the sons of God came to meet. And uh, uh, Satan, who was one of the sons of God, was questioned by God, what have you been doing? And he said, I've been moving to and fro in the earth. That also talks about uh, enjoying a greater dimensional uh, um, advantage, right? To and fro. I'm not going to get into that now. It's quite a, 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 a deep subject. But um, so we have an elder race. We have an elder family part of our family that never came to earth they were never made vice regions of planet earth adam the son of man adam yeah, adam the son of god was given earth to govern to be vice region over this realm some some of them some of our family never came to earth does that mean that they don't need the, the saving uh, uh, of Jesus Christ well the Bible is clear he did not die for the angels he came to die for the son of man those that were created to govern the earth realm but if Christ did not do that redemptive work it would have had a ripple effect on this, the sons of God in heaven anyway because uh, um, there's going to be a new heaven and earth so there was a defilement that was created yes it goes back to the thing we think of heaven as being this perfect place when in actual fact heaven was defiled we, that's why Jesus had to go and sprinkle his blood on the mercy seat because there was defilement in heaven so they were affected in a negative sense and this would also support 
the theory of why uh, the watchers, according to the book of Enoch, that also might I add, descended onto the summit of Mount Hermon, the meeting place of the gods, and they decided to take wives for themselves. So there you can already see the negative effect that the fall of Adam, the son of man, had on, or the son of God as well, had on our elder brothers that we look like. So I know that is, is, is difficult to, 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 to consume for a lot of, especially those within conservative, conservative circles, but uh, I, I really, I, I want to push you to think beyond, beyond your paradigm. So now heaven and earth, remember, were one that disengaged, earth fell from a lowest, from a higher state to a lower state. And these higher dimensional beings were denied access to the tree of life, just as much as Adam and Eve and humanity were. So Eden was a place of cosmic convergence. So we have God's garden, and then we have Adam's garden, and then we have the four rivers that or streams that run out of the garden of Adam or out of Adam. And like I say, these gardens were to, or these rivers were rivers of convergence, cosmic waters, waters that predate the inauguration of creation, that predate man's inauguration in creation. And this is why, why do you think when we go to the ocean, we feel like we, we, there's a reset that takes place when we go to the ocean. It's because we are reconnecting with a vibrational frequency that predates us, that predates this cosmos that was set up by fallen celestial beings. The waters, the primordial waters from the Genesis creation narrative predates our existence in creation. The waters are transporters into other realms. The ocean, existed before time, before creation. So the waters, water baptism, why do you think, why water? What is it about water? Why do we, are we submersed under water and we are come up and it's a, a, a symbol of new life? Because we are going under into the waters that are transported into other dimensions, waters that predate our inauguration in creation. So we are going back under the waters that transcend our realm, that transcend even our dimensional reality. Waters are a transporter into other realms. So we have the four rivers that converge at the place of the summit of Mount Hermon, the meeting of the gods, or the hub, Eden, which uh, interchangeably used is Eden, Adam. Now, this takes us back to the analogy, or let's say the stereotype of the first Anthropos and the last Anthropos. And Paul makes this abundantly clear in his revelation, in, in his Pauline revelation. He puts, the, he makes a stark contrast between the two Adams, two Adams. The first Adam, first Anthropos, human Adam, the one that failed, and the last one, Christ, that prevailed. And he talks about we were in a prison of sin in the first Anthropos, the first Adam, the first human. We were taken out of that prison, we were placed in a prison of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ Jesus, the last Anthropos, the last prototype of humanity and there is no one coming after him he is the perfect prototype the perfect representation of us and so we have Adam who had a garden who was vice regent over planet earth and he was to rule earth from his central hub the garden and there were four rivers that flowed out now there's many different teachings like i say variations some say the four rivers are uh, signifying the four chambers of the heart and uh, then there are different interpretations but there were definitely four living streams that came out of the being of adam and then adam was the stargate or the gate to the father's house what did Jesus say when he came? He said in John 10, I am the door to the sheepfold. He says, no one comes to the Father except through me. He said to Nicodemus in John 3, no one has ascended to heaven except the Son of Man who is in heaven and came down. So 
Adam initially was the stargate or the access point or the archway to the house of God because he comes from God's house. He was a son in the house of God. He fell from that, he fell to a lower estate. He fell to a lower place, to a lower realm, and he lost that access. The divine council met and they denied access to all beings into the garden to partake of the tree of life. Jesus Christ, who uh, in prophetic iconography is a symbol of the tree of life. Rivers of living water, he said, will gush out of your belly. So we know that we are in Christ, Christ is in us. So the living waters come out of us. The four rivers that are at the hub that are converged, the cosmic waters flow out of Adam. And more specifically, the last Adam, the last human, the last Anthropos Christ, we are in him. And those, these rivers are to give life and sustenance to the world. So that is basically what is what 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 is what it is portraying now let me go back now a lot would 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 uh, even within our prophetic apostolic uh, uh, um, realms of christianity would profess from behind their pulpits that they are releasing revelation about that god gave them about the four rivers or this or that and when there's something we have to understand and it goes back to what i said we have to keep the message focused on Christ. He's the center point of our message. A Christocentric message always leads us back to Christ, directs us to Christ. When we start to dive into man, like we talk about the four chambers of the heart coming out of Eden, and we can even go deeper, we are actually by default, whether it's intentionally or unintentionally, we are by default moving ourselves into Kabbalah, into Jewish mysticism, or even a, a form, a variation of Kabbalah that predates Kabbalah, which is chariot mysticism, Makava mysticism, because it puts man at the central focal point. It's an anthropocentric message about man as the center, because then it goes even deeper. It's very complex. It, it, when she talks about the brain and we talk about the, 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 the right side of the brain is intuition. Christ is seated on the right hand of the, of the right side of the brain and the left side is the accuser. So uh, um, thoughts of condemnation, they say, come from the left side and Satan, Hasatan in Hebrew, the accuser is seated at the right brain. I'm not saying all those concepts are not true. I think there is an element of truth to a lot of things, but we have to create a nexus within our Christian circles where we can take pieces of these 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 mystical insights and and biblical uh, insights and create a nexus and converge them and present a beautiful picture not only to our circles but to the world a deeper meaning of the fabrics of our existence and of our cosmos and the universe and our connection to our creator so adam was the hub adam was the stargate adam was the gate to the father's house and today christ jesus is the gate to the father's house he is the way he said no one goes to the Father except through me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the rivers flow out from him. And he sustains all creation, all humanity, the last Adam. Now, before we move on, I just want to bring a clear distinction uh, and definition to two terms, realms and dimensions. So when we talk about realm, realm literally means kingdom. That's what it means, kingdom. Uh, it is much more common to use this in fantasy works, whereas, you know, each region of existence is ruled by its own God, a cosmic entity or something. You'll really see this used in a more scientific flavored work, but it works well to give your work a more mystical flavor. So we hear about realms, the concept of realms in Narnia, Lord of the Rings, that type of stuff, movies, fiction. So when we talk about dimensions, dimension is more of a scientific term that is used in physics and science um, but now here's the thing a realm can consist of dimensions for example our earth realm uh, consists of a four-dimensional hyperspace three dimensions that we are in contact with the fourth one we cannot physically contact because we fell from a lower state but uh, within this earth realm we have a four-dimensional hyperspace so dimensions can be within realms so Adam was given the earth realm to govern, to be vice regent over and to advance the kingdom of heaven. 
and it was a back and forth type of operation it was to bring heaven to earth and it was to take earth to heaven so he was the stargate in more futuristic terms or contemporary terms so now this takes me to another term which is going to be controversial but let's just dive into it and that is what is called the axis mundi and this is very important for getting deeper insight into the eden mystery so the axis mundi uh, is universal. It's more commonly known as the tree of life. Uh, so not the tree of life, the world tree. And the world tree transcends uh, uh, religious boundaries, spiritual boundaries. It's known to the ancient he Hindus, the, the ancient Hebrews, the ancient Mesopotamians, uh, in ancient Mesopotamia, and even the Incas. So the Axis Mundi, known as, as the world tree, in ancient Mesopotamian cosmology, the world tree is a significant motif representing the axis of the universe. Very important, listen carefully. Connecting the heavens, the earth and the underworld. It is often depicted as a giant tree that serves as a source of life and fertility similar to the concepts found in various other myth mythologies. This tree may symbolize the pathway, listen carefully, the pathway of spiritual ascent, remember the archway, linking different realms, remember the cosmic waters, the four rivers that converge at the summit of Mount, summit of Mount Hermon and representing the essence of life, which we're going to get to at the end of this video. So that is the Axis Mundi. So here we have the tree concept, the world tree concept, the axis bundi, where we have the garden in the middle, we have the stem of the tree, and then the roots that branch out into the realm, or the earth realm more specifically. And what do roots carry? Water. What is water? It is a transporter into another realm. It's a transporter into another realm. So the four cosmic rivers that flowed from Eden or from Adam that sustain life in the earth realm are also transporters into other realms. So stick with me now, it's going to get quite complex. So the world tree branches out and it reaches into heaven and the roots extend out into the earth. Now, like I say, roots carry water, water is transported into other dimensions. So this now goes back to ancient Mesopotamian cosmology. And uh, as I said, Alberino mentions this three-tiered cosmology that's found in all ancient religions or spiritual beliefs. And it's the gateway of where these realms or rivers meet and it is situated on the summit of Mount Hermon. So when we think of the concept of Eden or the garden, it was in a sense an elevated place, the mountain of meeting or the mountain of the gods, the mountain of Adam. And from that place, he would govern the earth realm. And obviously, like we said, he fell from that estate and he was limited to our three dimensional spatial world or reality. So Hermon is a hub for realms. Hermon is a hub for realms. Eden was a hub for realms and the four rivers converged at this hub. So whether you believe it's four chambers of the heart, whether you believe it's four uh, um, spiritual uh, uh, supplies or sources that run into humanity or into earth, I believe we can, like I say, we can create a nexus with all these understandings and present a beautiful portrayal to the world of our creator, of our originality. So when we look at the four rivers or the four cosmic rivers that converge at the hub or the mount or the summit of Mount Hermon or they converge at the hub of the garden or Adam that is the stargate to the house of God. We find four a very important and uh, repeated number in the Bible. For example, we have the four seasons, Genesis chapter 1. We have the four corners of the earth. We have the four angels in Revelation chapter 7. We have the four living creatures in Ezekiel 1 and Revelation, which is the, the four faces of Yahweh. And we have the four Gospels. We have four synoptic Gospels. And then we have the four rivers. So very clearly four being very significant. 
And now, like I say, you can draw a lot of different uh, um, insights and interpretations and revelations from exactly what those four rivers are. So I believe, do I believe that it represents four chambers of the heart? Absolutely. Do I believe that it represents uh, four streams of spiritual life that are to sustain the earth from, to sustain humanity? Absolutely. Uh, I believe those are parts of the puzzle, but I leave, I, I believe it, um, it's uh, part of a far deeper, more profound mystery now here is a map of the four cosmic rivers branching out from eden from the hub okay now if we want to look at this in a spiritual sense or a deeper profound meaning with a, a, a in a spiritual sense we can let's look at the first river Pishon. so this is Pishon is known as the river of eden or of gold and i find this extremely interesting because uh, this river is descriptive of the Spirit's work in the consciousness of man. And it is known as the river of gold, or this land possesses gold from this river, and which means that locked up in our body temples are the treasures of the Spirit, which is very interesting because we have a scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 7, where Paul says that, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So very interesting. The second river, Gihon, known as the river of paradise. Now, this is known as the breath of God that inspires man and purifies his blood. Now, the Gihon river was a fountain or a pool with springs just outside of Jerusalem. And this indicates a bursting forth of joyous life and truth. This is also depictive of the peace that comes from the ruling factor of the heart and the mind um, in abundant life and also uh, depictive of substance, wisdom. So that's one interpretation and that comes from ancient Hebrew uh, cosmology or ancient Hebrew literature. So the third one will be the Tigris River, also known as the Hidakal River, and this means to break forth. So this symbolizes the spiritual nerve fluid. Now we're going back, like I say, we're delving into more of a mystical uh, uh, chariot mysticism type of uh, concept, your understanding or insight into this. But anyway, they say it symbolizes the spiritual nerve fluid that God is propelling throughout man's whole being continually. Talks about the electromagnetic center of every physically expressed atom. Very interesting. This wonderful stream of nerve fluid finds its way all over in man's body temple, giving him the invigorating, steadying power of the Holy Spirit. So then very quickly, the Euphrates River, which is the more popular one out of the four and the one that uh, uh, draws more interest because of the account in the scripture where it say, says that um, the watches that descended on Mount Hermon are bound in chains under the Euphrates River. So there is a realm or an access point at the Euphrates River because remember the cosmic rivers are transported into other realms. So um, in rabbinic tradition, they say Euphrates does not interpret rivers literally. Instead, they are believed to represent honey, milk, Baslam and wine. Now this is going to take me to something very interesting and it goes back to the concept of transporting things from one realm into another which I also did in a previous video. So when I when I saw wine I found this extremely profound because uh, we look at the concept of Jesus turning water into wine. Now stick with me, stick with me here. Jesus turns water into wine. Now most of the times we think of that, we read it in the scripture, we learn about it, we study about it, and we don't really ask the question, so where, where did the wine actually come from? We know it was a miracle. He converted water into wine. But if you think of it technically, where did it really come from? So I would add the wine that Jesus use that he converted from water jesus remember water a transporter into other realms jesus transported wine from the cellar of the father's house into this physical earth realm so jesus had the ability access you remember he's the stargate to the house of god the lost adam the lost anthropos 
He is the access point, the archway, the doorway into the house of God. So Christ transported a capsule of reality from another realm more specifically from the father's house and he transported wine from the father's cellar in the father's house into the earth realm into that party in canaan and he presented them the wine and uh the 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 people said where did you get this wine this is the great the the best wine he's ever tasted why because it was transported from the cellar of the father's house so the rivers, the cosmic rivers, are transporters into other realms. Water pre-existed our temporal, spatial uh, um, realm that we call Earth, three-dimensional uh, realm of space, time, and locality. It predates us. It predates our inauguration. So Jesus had access to the cosmic rivers, and they all meet at the hub of Christ, who is the doorway to life the tree of life now people would say oh you're saying god drinks wine i'm not saying the father drinks wine maybe he does i would uh, um i would say he does but it's not in a in a in a fallen state remember we live in a fallen world um so we are naturally gravitated towards or inclined to do things in a fallen nature but everything here is a carbon copy of the things that are in heaven. Like I went, let's go back to what I said. Heaven is a physical place. It has everything here is a carbon copy, a reflection of what is in heaven. And Adam was sent here as vice region to advance that reality, that realm in the earth realm, and to reconverge them in the earth realm, and to bring a reconvergence and a sort of like an interface heaven invading earth and earth having access to the house of god through the anthropos and we know this time it's christ jesus he prevailed and so well i believe the father has a wine cellar and he enjoys the things we enjoy but in a perfect state so that's something to ponder on so That is my presentation of Eden and the cosmic waters. So we have Eden, the garden of God, in the house of God. We have Adam and Eve's garden that was placed eastward of Eden. And then we have this whole concept of the Axis Mundi or the world tree. And this world tree is to give life to the earth realm. And the branches extend out into the leaves, which depicts the heavenly realm. And then it roots down into the earth realm, the axis mundi or the world tree. And it's all a picture of our prototype, Christ Jesus, the last anthropos, the last human, the carrier of all humanity, the doorway, the stargate to the father's house. Jesus, the son of God, the son of man, the only one that will be worthy to open the scroll of mankind because he was born into the world as a human being. He is fully God and fully man and he is fully invading or he is fully invading our reality. So the important thing that I want to leave you with here is that first of all Christ is the central point, the central focus. Not Metatron, not even Melchizedek, But Christ Jesus, the last Anthropos, the last Adam, the final representative of humanity, the perfect prototype. And he is the stargate. He is the archway. He is the Eden to the house of God. Hallelujah. I hope this blessed you. I'd love to hear what you think. Give me your feedback on this. Share with me your insights. Remember, um, there is no exclusive revelation or insight to this because most of it is plagued in ambiguity. We can speculate, we can have mystical insight, we can have revelatory insight, but no one holds the absolute or the clear understanding. And one day it will be all revealed to us. But we can create this nexus and converge our insights together to present a beautiful portrayal to the world, just as the cosmic waters converge at the summit of Hermon, the place where the watchers descended And we know what happened according to the book of Enoch. So also to remember that we have this elder race that are our elder siblings. We have a family in heaven, not angels, 
not talking about angel, angelic beings. Angels are messengers, but the sons of God, they are f- members of our family that never came to earth because they were never given the, uh, um, they were never given or entrusted um, with the earth to govern the earth, but Adam was. And maybe that, might I add, maybe that is the reason why they, some of them fell. Maybe they felt that um, we were given a privilege that was, that was above theirs. So even though we look like them, even though they have greater uh, um, dimensional advantage over us, there is still something profound and unique about us that sets us apart from our elder siblings and that might be the reason what caused some of them to fall but we are definitely a unique masterpiece of our creator and we are connected to the heart of God we are connected to the garden of God we are sons in the house of God bless you and I'll see you in the next video